Assalamu alaikum. In this video, we will discuss patient safety for hysterectomy. The case scenario is as follows. A 44-year-old patient presents with heavy and regular menstruation. She is worried about her symptoms. She has had four children as spontaneous vaginal deliveries, youngest 20 years old. An ultrasound scan of the pelvis shows multiple uterine fibroids and normal ovaries. The hemoglobin level is 8 grams per deciliter. She is hypertensive with a weight of 100 kilograms and a height of 164 centimeters. She is counseled for hysterectomy and she consents to the procedure. What steps will you take to ensure patient safety for surgery? Before the operation, during the procedure and in the post-operative period. First, by way of introduction, we will talk about the procedure hysterectomy. This is a very common procedure performed in obstetrics and gynecology. This patient has large fibroids and is very uncomfortable with her heavy periods, making her anemic and affecting the quality of her life. She wants to have a complete cure of her condition. As the patient is 44 years old, we must discuss her opinion on removing the ovaries at the time of surgery. The patient is informed that currently, according to medical evidence, we believe that even after menopause, the ovaries have a contribution in maintaining bone health. On the other hand, if we leave the ovaries behind, we need to follow up to ensure there is no tumor formation in the ovaries. The chances of ovarian cancer is low if there is no family history. But if there is a strong family history of breast, uterine, colon or lung cancer, the risk of ovarian cancer increases. As long as the patient understands the implications of having ovaries removed, she should make an informed consent about this part of the procedure. Once she has agreed to the procedure, we have to make sure that her surgery is planned so that she recovers from her surgery without any complications. To do this, we must understand her risk factors for anesthesia and surgery and minimize them before the surgery is performed. In addition, safety precautions will have to be taken during the surgical procedure and the recovery period. In the pre-operative period, the clinical history should be reviewed again to highlight her medical problems and their severity. The history should be examined to ensure no other complaints concerning the menstrual period apart from heavy regular periods. We should inquire about postcoital bleeding and intermenstrual bleeding. Apart from menstrual symptoms, we need to review if she has had any other symptoms which have developed recently or have been present for a long time. For example, cough with sputum, breathlessness, coughing on lying down, gastrointestinal disturbances or urinary symptoms. In the past medical history, the patient has been hypertensive. It is important to understand how long has she been hypertensive? Is she taking any medication for hypertension? What is the dose of the medicine? Does she have any regular medical checkups concerning hypertension? When was the last time she had an electrocardiogram, chest x-ray or blood lipid profile? 
Are there any consultations or investigations she has had in the previous two years? If so, does she have any written record of these? We will then do a general physical examination and a pelvic examination to confirm ultrasound and clinical findings. The patient then has to undergo a series of investigations for assessment of her health and these include complete blood picture with peripheral film, random blood sugar, blood sugar with saving of serum for further cross matching, hepatitis B surface antigen, hepatitis B antibodies and hepatitis C antibodies. Urine detailed report and culture and sensitivity, creatinine, urea, thyroid stimulating hormone levels, liver function test, lipid profile, chest x-ray, ECG, echocardiogram if she has any symptoms of breathlessness, transvaginal with pelvic ultrasound if her previous ultrasound was done some time ago, cervical smear if she has never had it done or if any past smear showed abnormality. After the initial assessment and investigations, the following risk factors are identified. Number one, she is overweight. Number two, she is anemic. Number three, she is hypertensive. And number four, she is over 40 years of age. All these risk factors must be kept in mind while planning the surgery and performing the procedure in the, and in the post-operative period. The patient will be referred for anesthetic assessment and discussion of anesthesia. If any abnormality is noted in the cardiac evaluation, the patient will be referred to a cardiologist for further review, management and stabilization before considering surgery. The information about the patient's name, medical identification number, the name of the surgery to be performed and the surgeon's name should be entered accurately to ensure there is no error on the day of the operation. A number of the operating team should see the patient after admission to ensure she is ready for surgery and has no questions. In addition, there should be no new symptoms that have developed. She should not have any fever, any rhinitis, any cough with sputum. The pre-operative orders should be written down clearly and communicated to the nurse who will be carrying out these ward orders in the ward. If the patient is receiving any drugs for hypertension, do not stop them even when she is nil by mouth. She can swallow them with a sip of water at the time she is supposed to take her dose. Write down orders for prophylactic antibiotics with clear instructions to transport the antibiotics with the patient when she goes to the operating theatre. For overweight patients, it is important to give prophylactic treatment for deep vein thrombosis. This includes medication, wearing thromboembolic preventive stockings and early mobilization in the post-operative period. On the day of surgery, a member of the operating team should be in the OR to receive the patient. During the operation, special precautions are taken to ensure safety. If we anticipate adhesions in the pelvis, 
an infra umbilical vertical incision should be made to access the pelvis as well as the lower part of the abdomen freely. While opening the abdomen, ensure the bowel and the bladder are safe. When performing the hysterectomy, ensure the pedicles are identified, skeletonized to allow clamping, cutting and suturing. For some pedicles, consider transfixation so that the suture does not slip off. Identify the ureter and ensure it is out of the way when clamping the uterine artery. Identify the uterosacral ligament and, and the uterovesical ligament carefully. Carefully dissect the bladder from the front of the cervix. Remember the three categories of complications for any operation. The first and most important one is infection, which can be prevented by following infection control principles by the team members, the administration and the operating room team. The second complication is bleeding, which can be avoided by carefully identifying structures, dissection and ligation. The third complication is organ damage, which can be prevented by keeping pelvic structures out of the way with swabs, packs and instruments. After completing the procedure and closing the abdomen, the rectus sheath should be stitched carefully with suitable sutures to prevent incisional hernia. The operation notes should be written clearly and completely with mention of complications if any. The notes should be checked by the surgeon for accuracy. The surgical team should send the specimens to the laboratory. Postoperatively, the patient will be kept in the recovery area until she is stable and awake and then shifted to the ward. In the wards, the patient should be seen at least twice a day by the operating team to make sure no complications are developing post-operatively. Post-operative complications include infection, bleeding and symptoms of organ damage. Early recognition of complication leads to prompt treatment and complete resolution. If the patient has vomiting, and abdominal distension, identify the cause and manage appropriately. If the patient is unable to avoid urine, identify the cause and manage appropriately. If the patient is not passing flatus, then identify the cause and manage. Keep the patient and her family informed of her progress and reassure them if all is well. Plan the discharge early with careful instructions for recovering of the patient at home. With this we come to the end of the video. If you like the video then please subscribe, share, comment and press the bell icon for further notifications of videos. Thank you and goodbye.